let's see, attendees. All right, and with that, uh, we wanna get started. So I am going to um, kick off the main by introducing Dr. Shakina Williams, who is gonna be our host for the day. Uh, welcome, Shakina. All right, thank you, Christina. Hello, everybody. Again, my name is Dr. Shakina Williams. I'm Director of Global Initiatives for the Center for Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership and WinLab, which stands for Women Innovating Now, which is our five-month accelerator program. The Sewell and WinLab team is taking action to bring solutions and support to entrepreneurs and small businesses in sustaining and accelerating growth while adjusting to these new market conditions during these unprecedented times. We are so happy that you've joined us for our webinar series. Today, our topic will be building, on, building an online community. We are honored to have Beth Santos, founder and CEO of Wonderful, and a WinLab alumna. Beth will be discussing ways to develop and sustain an online community as a, as a business development strategy. She will share best practices and tools on how to cultivate and sustain an online community during these trying times. But before I turn it over to Beth for her session, I would like to introduce my colleague, Casey Connors, who will be monitoring the chat feature. So put anything you would like, questions, comments. Um, we've practiced that a little bit, um, letting us know where you are dialing in from. And then next, I'd like to introduce um, Christina, who opened the call, who, who's going to walk us through how to navigate through Zoom that will allow us to have an interactive session. So over to you, Christina. All right. Um, thanks again, uh, Shakina. Um, so let me uh, walk you through the use of Zoom. Uh, I know this is a very popular platform that a lot of people have been using in, in general and now with um, the situation. Uh, so for this webinar, we are only having video for the panelists or for um, the host of the session. Uh, attendees won't have video, so we don't have to worry about that. Don't worry, you can be wearing whatever you want to be wearing <laughs> today. Um, now, in terms of audio, unmuting versus unmuting, uh, uh, as you know, everyone has been muting to avoid background noise. Uh, that said, we have the ability to unmute, and you can unmute yourself if you wish to speak during the Q&A session. Please wait until we uh, get to that area and that we call people to uh, ask their questions. As we mentioned, um, Casey will be um, monitoring the chat, so we will call people as um, we go. Um, uh, to unmute yourself or to turn on your audio, uh, in the bottom of the, um, the menu area, you will see the icons in the lower hand side of your screen, so you can click there. Um, as we have mentioned, we will be, since we have a lot of people in the call today, we'll be using the chat feature to monitor the Q&A. Um, you can see that in the bottom of your screen in the chat icon. Um, so please feel free to utilize this feature uh, to send any messages to the WIN team or all the panelists. Uh, feel free to ask questions and we'll be monitoring that and helping Beth with that. Um, if you have any trouble with the tech, please feel free to send me a message. I'll be monitoring that closely uh, to make sure that everyone's um, able to ask their questions. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Shakina again. All right, so Christina has given us the rules here, how we're going to have an interactive ses session with Beth. But before Beth starts, I just want to let everybody know I'm not on Babson campus, as you can see in, on my back screen. I am dialing in from Western Massachusetts. So Beth, to start us off, where are you? Located right now, I am in Boston in All my right. house. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. So many of us are, I yes. know, but mm -hmm. I love how many people from around the world are joining us. So, thank you all for being here. So if it works for you guys, I'll kick it off. And what I want to do is, first of all, share my screen that you can have that and we'll get full screen for you. Let me know, um, by the way, in case you didn't know this about me, I see a couple people that I know who are here. I um, love conversation. I love keeping everyone engaged. And so I would love to let this be as interactive as possible. If you have 
questions along the way, if there are things that really resonate with you that you want to know more about, um, ask. Because I was telling everyone when we were first planning this that I said, you know, I've got a presentation here and I can tell you all about building community, what I've learned. But if everyone has questions and you want to take it a whole different direction, we're prepared to do that. So this is what this is all about. Um, and of course, I have to preface this all with the the work from home preface that I think everyone is experiencing right now, which is that I have a three-year-old who is currently sleeping, which 80% likeliness she will wake up right at the most inconvenient time. So make sure that you're all prepared for that. I've got my husband helping as well, but, um, but we wanna make this as useful as possible. And so we're talking about building online community. I wanna talk about not only how that has historically been done, but also how it's changed. And of course, let me introduce my self a little bit here. Um, so my name is Beth. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Wonderful, which is an international community of women who love to travel. And as the lovely ladies here mentioned, we are, um, I'm a Babson WinLab uh, participant. I participated in 2016 to 2017. Um, besides that, I also went to Wellesley undergrad, so I was right around the corner for Babson when I was there, and actually um, spent a lot of my life in the nonprofit and international development space. Um, I was an art history major, and as you may or may not have expected, 2008 was not a great time to graduate from undergrad, let alone with an art history degree, so it sent me traveling. And that's when my business really began. Um, and eventually went to business school um, to study social enterprise and entrepreneurship and innovation. And who would have thunk that the thing that ended up being kind of a side project um, out of college ends up now being my full-time job. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about the wonderful story. Before I do that though, I wanna give you a general understanding of what we're going to discuss today. The first thing is really just getting us all on the same page of what a community even means and really the different forms that a community can take for different businesses. Because I think oftentimes we have uh, different understandings of what we're talking about when we talk about communities. The second thing I wanna do is give you some real tips on you know, how to know if creating a community is good for you, whether you have a business now, whether you're starting your own business, whether you're working for somebody else's business, and really, honestly, when you shouldn't waste your time on it, you know, when it might be better to partner with somebody else or to do some other activity. Um, giving you hard tactics, things that you can use um, throughout your time and, um, and whether it's now or whether keeping it in the back pocket uh, for later. And then of course, some lessons from my own story um, that you can do. And of course, I can never end a presentation without giving you just a list of my favorite tools and resources. So we'll give you that as well. Uh, but before I go too deep, what I do want to know, I see all of you are pretty familiar with Zoom and familiar with chat. So, um, so tell me, what do you want to know? What did you come into this presentation wanting to know? I'd be curious um, what kind of uh, piqued your interest about this topic. I would also be curious to know how many of you are current business owners versus thinking about starting a business of your own later versus you know not in any of those categories, but working for somebody else. I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about yourself. So go ahead and throw something in the chat. What questions do you have? What do you wanna know? What piqued your interest? Um, and ah, now they start coming in. So tips on engagement. It's one thing to have followers, but how do we engage them? Seems like the hardest thing these days. Really good question. Yes, we can definitely talk about engagement. Another one from Whole You. Hi, Whole You. We have hundreds of clients over the past eight years and now wanna transition them into an alumni network. Okay, great. Awesome. Laura says, I run a nonprofit and I really want to build a thriving online community in our virtual platform. Cool. And Elizabeth wants to know how creating a community translates into revenue. We can talk about that. Courtney wants to know the first three steps to take to start a community. Oh my goodness, you guys have such good questions. I'd love to know about how to create a sense of unity in social media without meeting them. Okay, we'll keep those coming to um, we can definitely address a lot of these things, both during my presentation as well as in the Q&A. So let's get this party started a little bit. So, so I'll take you a little bit into the story of Wonderful and where we all started. This is really the quick description of who we are. Wonderful is an international lifestyle brand and community, and our mission is to help women travel the world. 
um, that is the kind of overarching umbrella goal of uh, what we're trying to do here. And we actually do that in three separate ways. The first is through this live online, offline network of women travelers who support one another, who share tips and resources, who meet up with one another when they travel to new places and really build a sense of sisterhood. And in a lot of ways, to be honest, it has to do with self-care. It has to do with encouraging women to get out there in the world and actually travel and having other women who say, yes, you can book that trip. You absolutely should do that. You deserve this, that kind of thing. The second thing that we do is we help women who are building businesses and travel. And a lot of those women are digital content creators. I'll tell you about how we started. Um, when we started, it was as a blog. And so we found that a lot of um, people who start blogs end up building businesses that are either directly or tangentially related to that. And so we really want to encourage women to, um, to not just you know, grow in the travel industry, but actually build businesses that fundamentally make the travel industry more inclusive, um, more equitable. And so that's the third part of all of this is actually challenging the travel industry to do that. And we have a lot of industry level um, programs that we run that help industry marketers talk about you know, how they can reach travelers in more mean, meaningful ways, how they can do it more authentically and honestly, and how they can leverage things like content creators to do that. So we have a few prongs, not only running our own community, but then helping other people build theirs. I mentioned that when we started Wonderful, it started as a blog, which I think is a really interesting origin story for a lot of people. Oftentimes, you know, when I'm talking with somebody or doing like an interview or something, people will say, oh, you know, what was the big idea? What was the, the, that initial spark that prompted you to start your business? And I always say to them, you know, when Wonderful started, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a direct problem solution type scenario that a lot of startups have. It wasn't like, oh, you know, I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt and I feel really hot. Hey, what if I cut the sleeves and made it a short sleeve shirt? Ta-da, I've made a business. For us, what it was, was a feeling. It was a feeling of, um, you know, I was traveling on my own. I was living in a country called Sao Tome and Principe, which is a two island nation off the west coast of Africa. I felt the, the weight of being a woman on her own in the world, suddenly realizing that women are treated differently around the world and also not having that support network. And I think at the time, I kind of felt like I was one of the only people doing it, even though I definitely wasn't. And actually, if you know anything about travel nowadays, you'll know that, or anything about travel marketing, you'll know that actually 80% of decisions in the travel industry are made by women. So women are treated often as a minority in travel, but we're actually overwhelmingly the majority in spend, in decision-making, and even in travelers of our own. And so that's what started to make us realize that there was something more of a business um, there. But I tell you the story because um, when we began, we really began as a community from the beginning. We had an audience, we um, had a, an active Facebook group, and then we started hosting events. And fast forward to today, this is a kind of a quick look at what we do. So really looking at, you know, that kind of international lifestyle brand, we run a conference called the Women in Travel Summit. We now do it um, on two continents worldwide for influencers and um, creators to build relationships with travel industry members. We um, just launched a, a festival called Wanderfest that we're going to be doing next March of 2021. We're crossing our fingers on that one, as well as the Bessie Awards, which honors women of impact and travel. Um, we have a, a membership community, which is an online space where women can pay to have access to um, courses, to uh, virtual workshops, to other members that they can meet all around the world. We have chapters in 50 global cities where women historically have met up in person for um, events, for uh, a sense of community right at home. We have a global home sharing network where women can actually stay with each other when we travel. We just launched a radio station with Pandora Music that you can, if you're in the US, you can actually listen to. It's called Women Who Travel Radio. It's music from women around the world. And of course, we have a blog. And that's where we all started in, within the space of online content. And as you look at these things, you'll notice that some of the things I've said, you know, we did this, we might continue to do this. And I think I'm not alone when I say that, you know, business in the, even the last month, in the last two weeks has changed fundamentally. And you can imagine being in a space like travel um, and a space where most of our revenue comes from um, in-person connection. It comes from uh, the travel industry spending. I'll show you this slide here that I'm going to 
the Passover. Yeah, so 95% of our revenue has historically come from conference sponsorships, conference ticket sales, chapter events, influencer campaigns that we've run with travel brands um, and our home sharing network. And so when things started to slow down, um, you can also see how that's affected some of the things that we've done as a business. Women in Travel Summit, we had to postpone. Um, Wanderfest, we're obviously not you know, selling tickets for right now. A lot of the things that have driven our revenue historically have been pushed to the side. And I wanted to share that story with you because even though we started as a community, we've always been building community, we have ourselves also been in a significant pivoting phase where most of the previous revenue generating activities that we focused on have been kind of moved to the side. And that leaves us with really one primary thing that we've been spending a significant amount of time on as a team, which is really digging in deep into our membership community. And I wanna talk with you about that today um, because not only has it been a source of learning for us, but it has also been a source of strength. And we've seen really in the past month that engagement has increased significantly in our community on their membership platform because people are looking for support in a way that they're not getting, especially people who, who love to travel, frankly, and who can't be doing it right now. So um, I think it's, it's given us a lot of really important lessons, um, lessons that I hope to pass along to you, but also you know, an example of how um, you can actually shift your revenue streams and how things can, uh, things may change that you never anticipate, but we can still kind of work our ways around them. Um, so the, sorry, I'm having trouble with my mouse. Um, the, okay, so what is a community? Let's actually talk about that first, because I mentioned we all have different descriptions of what that means. I've seen a lot of people who say community, but they actually don't really mean it quite the way. Here's your more textbook definition, right? This is a group of people with a particular characteristic in common. Often they have a feeling of shared experience or interpersonal connection or belonging. Um, the re the, but when we're talking about online community, um, it, things change, right? You're not interacting with somebody in person. In fact, you may never interact with somebody in person, and yet you still have to cultivate this sense of belonging, this sense of interconnectedness with people who are just connecting over video. And even though we still capture a good amount of the body language that we miss in in-person interactions. You still don't have that feeling, even when you're putting together an event like this. You know, imagine if we were all sitting in a room right now, rather than doing a webinar, there's so much information that, that we, we get in that in-person scenario. We walk into a room and we see how it's set up. Is it set up in tables? Is it set up theater style? Are we supposed to listen? Are we supposed to be engaged? You see, um, you know, is there food there? Should we be meeting and mingling? You have a chance to chat with another person. You see how people are dressed. You see how people respond to things. You see when somebody says something and somebody else laughs, you realize it was a joke. All of these things that we kind of lose in the online space, we have to compensate for. Um, communication becomes more important than ever, right? We have to utilize multiple channels to do it, to get one point across. Think of how many times you sent an email out to whether it was your team or a friend or your spouse or whatever, and like they respond to you and clearly they've only read, you know, a tenth of the email and you're like, ah, oh, just answer my question. So imagine that when you're trying to manage hundreds or dozens or thousands of people and making sure that people are getting the messages that you're sending out. You have to use different channels. You have to use different ways of communicating and you have to do that on the regular without at the same time sounding redundant or overwhelming or messaging too much. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is when we move into the digital space, you also compete with people's inboxes. And I'm not just talking about you know email inboxes, but I'm talking about the fact that we're all members of 40 different Facebook groups now. And, you know, depending on if somebody set their notifications for your Facebook group or not, that might be the, the win or loss of your business right there. Sometimes it's little things that you don't realize are um, even a huge part of, you know, kind of the way you've set up your business model. But because we're relying on third party applications, making sure that people are using the product the way 
it is best used for your purposes is absolutely essential. And then the last part, because I know this is a little bit of doom and gloom about why digital communities are worse, but I'd actually say that there's some really neat things about what digital has done, including democratizing the playing field. Now you can have people join your community that may have never found your company before because so many people have more access to you than ever could have otherwise. Um, so you're giving people a chance to, to connect with you in a way that they couldn't have um, before, both ge across geographies, across experiences, across a lot of different um, qualities. So audience versus community, I think is an important distinction to make. A few of you mentioned topics like social media, and we will definitely get into that, but I also want to clarify kind of what the difference is between having an audience, which is um, somebody who, you know, who listens to you. So when we started our blog, for example, I wouldn't necessarily say we had started with a community, we had started with an audience. You know, it's a two-sided conversation. Oftentimes it's, in, it's, it's, it's started on your end, you're leading the conversation. And if you were to ever leave the conversation, the conversation would pretty much be over because people are reacting to you. In a community, you're a facilitator. You're having a multi-sided conversation. You're not always the one that's actually leading that conversation. You can help direct it, but it also kind of has a life of its own. And in some instances, you know, people have found that they start communities and then their communities go on without them. And it's a plus and a minus, you know, I think um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's a magical experience to be able to start something that can live on. Um, but in other ways, it means that you um, have to be very thoughtful about what rules and, um, and what culture you're setting from the beginning, because it's very hard to change the course of your community um, halfway through. Okay, types of online communities. So uh, these are a couple of examples of what a community might look like. It could be a free or paid membership platform, which is kind of what we're doing with our wonderful community right now. It might just be taking recurring Zoom meetings and virtual events. One could argue that what we're doing right now is, is, is having a community just in, in and of our own where you're able to provide feedback with each other, you're able to talk to each other. Um, if I were to, you know, unmute everyone, it would be even more so, right, that we're all kind of participating in this together, we're all driving the direction of this organization together. So maybe your community is, you know, building upon an email list and actually putting together recurring Zoom meetings and virtual events that people can gather for. Another thing we see in a lot is Slack channels, you know, for better or for worse. I think a lot of Slack channels um, have started when Slack first started getting really hot. Um, and then I'm sure, you know, a few of you have joined a Slack channel that was like really excited in the beginning and then kind of died and nobody participated in it. That's an example of a low engagement community. And, um, and so I think, you know, understanding where people are, what tools they want to use, what they're ready to use um, can be really helpful for you. And then Facebook or meetup groups, um, that is probably the one of the first things that you thought of when you thought about online communities, starting a group on Facebook. Um, if you're not familiar with meetup, meetup is a platform that actually facilitates in-person connection. So a lot of people join meetup because they want to meet up with somebody. They want to go to a, you know, Japanese language circle downtown in Boston, or they want to go swing dancing, or they have some shared interest and they meet up in person. And as you can imagine, Meetup has also had to evolve during this time where they're encouraging more virtual meetups and they're partnering with um, platforms that can do that. Laura asked the question of, do you recommend public or closed Facebook groups for communities? And it is a great question that um, is an ever increasing debate in the community space. I think you're going to find benefits um, and downsides on both sides. And here's basically what they are. If you start a public Facebook group, um, well, first of all, I think the, the question is, what is your Facebook group about, right? So if it's um, a Facebook group for, you know, in our case, the local Boston chapter of Wonderful, we keep that closed because we actually want to be able to approve the members that come in. 
Um, when we approve them, we also can ask questions about, you know, who they are and why they want to be part of the group. And it creates a little bit more of a higher engagement level because we're, we're closing the doors a little bit. The other thing that it does is it creates a little bit more of a sense of security. If you're in a public group, then if you post something in your group, even somebody who's not in that group will know that you posted it. So it can be disincentivizing for members who maybe are asking a private question or, you know, worried about what other people might think about something they say, they most likely won't post it in a public group. That being said, public groups will in many cases grow much more quickly because they are a little bit more of just a, you know, un, un, not, not that it's uncontrolled, but less controlled than maybe a private group. The other thing to keep in mind is once you are a private group, it is very hard to go public, but if you're a public group, you can privatize. So in protecting people's information, they don't want it to have started as a private group, people to share private things and then it to go public and everybody can see it, but you can close it down more. So sometimes people will actually start as a public group and then eventually close it down once they've hit a certain amount of critical mass. But I think what your group is about is going to uh, have an effect on that as well. And what type of, you know, if it's connected to a business, maybe you want a little bit more of a sense of culture and a sense of intimacy between your group members versus a public group might be for like people who love dogs and anybody can join. Great question. Okay. This is, um, so let's talk a little bit about the benefits of an online community for, I'm talking about this from the perspective of your business, because I think a lot of you are business owners or prospective business owners and entrepreneurs. Um, then we're also going to talk about the things that you should really be thinking about if you want to start a community. So why you might want to start a community, there are some great reasons out there. First of all, um, if anything, I think a lot of people who start communities, so you may, so there's two things. You may have a community that your revenue source is your community. In our case for Wonderful, for example, I mentioned that 100% of our revenues are coming from paid members right now. So community is our business model. In other people's circumstances, the community is not your business model, but it is a way to make the sales pipeline for your business shorter because you are um, creating a sense of support for people who are your biggest prospects or your existing customers or, you know, your, your most valuable members. And so, um, so, so whether you have it for yourself or whether you have it for a business that you've Kind of generated and you're trying to build a community around it, having that membership experience gives you a little bit of that shorter sales pipeline because you have people who are clearly interested in being part of what you're doing in an elevated way and who um, who kind of want more of it. The other thing that you get from that is a much faster feedback cycle and therefore, in my opinion, a faster innovation cycle. It allows you to make changes to your business very quickly because your super users are giving you direct feedback and they love it too, right? Because they feel like you're listening to them, you're incorporating the things that they're looking for, um, that they matter to you. And so it's kind of a giving cycle and in that way it builds trust. Um, the other thing I love about membership, which we've certainly learned now, is, you know, if you have a paid membership model, it's recurring revenue that you're not relying on anybody, you know, in a world where a lot of our revenues came from sponsorships and ticket sales. It's nice to know that once we bring on a member, they're, they're part of the community until they opt out. Um, and if it's not your primary source of revenue, it's a new channel. It's one that you can, you know, kind of focus on one time uh, in terms of getting somebody to come on one time. And then hopefully as long as you're creating a good experience, they're going to be recurring. Um, the uh, one other question is, what are your thoughts on WhatsApp for business to build communities? Oh, that's interesting. You know, WhatsApp is... Uh, I have not used WhatsApp for business, so I would have to look. And if there is anyone who has, please comment, because I think it would be, we'll facilitate that conversation. We have actually seen a lot of our chapters outside of the US use WhatsApp for our chapters, and it's been hugely successful for them. I think there is value to the, the possibly one of the most important things you can do when deciding on your community that is not in this presentation, but I'll tell you now, 
is understanding the platform that your customers and your members are on right now, whoever that customer is, what platform are they on now? What platform are they spending their time on? And then ideally for the highest conversion rate, use that. So when we had Facebook and Meetup in our Madrid chapter, for example, they paled in comparison to what our WhatsApp group was doing. Because once people joined WhatsApp, they were already on it, they used it all the time, they would message each other, they would connect with each other. And so I think knowing where your customer is already is going to be a very strong indicator on where your community should exist. Um, Hole, you asked if I've done pricing research, what is the range? Is it monthly and or annual? So if you're, are you talking about, I'm assuming you're talking about um, wonderful in general. I have found, so, so our membership is, uh, it's $69 a year for travelers and $139 a year US for creators. We have two tiers and creators get business support. They get um, coaching, they get mastermind calls, that kind of thing. We actually had a monthly subscription for a while. It was five bucks a month. And I backed out of that because it is really hard to justify uh, when, you, when you have a monthly subscription, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying these are the things you should think about. When you have a monthly subscription, it means that every month your customer is going to evaluate, is this membership valuable for me? Should I continue? And in our space, which is travel, people don't necessarily travel every month. So they might not have used our community every month because they might not have been traveling every month. So we decided to switch it to annual because you're going to over the year look back and be like, oh yeah, I use this for the however many trips that I went on more than looking at it from a month to month basis. I think the other, the argument on the other side is that, you know, $5 a month might sound less expensive than $69 a year. Or I think in that, at that time it was like $59 a year or something like that. Um, so there is some psychology in there, but I would think about, you know, how are people evaluating uh, the value that you're providing? Is it on a monthly basis or is it on an annual basis? And if it's on an annual basis, the other thing I might consider is if you do have a paid enrollment or a paid membership, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. You might even consider having enrollment periods where you're not having membership open all the time. You're just having it open during enrollment periods. And that's when people can actually join because you're creating a little bit more of a sense of um, a sense of scarcity, honestly. And I think with ongoing things like membership, sometimes it can be challenging to get people to actually sign up. And so having windows where people can sign up, that not only creates that scarcity, but it also gives you a chance to educate them in cohorts about how to be part of this community, what you can do, you know, what you can learn, whether it's, you know, an, an automated series in your email um, provider, whether it's you doing like a welcome party and a webinar for the new cohort, you're able to control a little bit more of the user experience. Um, okay. So I see some questions, so I'm going to continue and then I'll make sure to answer those questions. Um, so those are some of the benefits. Now let me tell you some of the things that you should think about if you do want to create a community of any kind. The first is, do you even need one? <laughs> like, let's be honest. Do you even need one and does the market even need one, right? So um, are there communities already out there that are like yours, especially for, I see a question about, um, uh, from the perspective of physical products that are required to be sold to generate revenue. Oh, are you, can you help us understand benefits of the online community more from the perspective of physical products? So can you clarify, do you mean physical products like online courses that they're purchasing or do you mean physical products like, like actual physical product? Yeah. Can you clarify? Cause I'm not hundred percent sure what you mean by that. Um, but I was going to say the, um, uh, if, if your community already exists in various manifestations from other people, maybe it's more beneficial to partner with them than to try to create your own thing. Like what is your unique value proposition here? And especially when you are selling a product, okay, so they're saying actual products such as sustainable apparel. I was just gonna say with something like a physical product, one thing that you can fall into if you're not very careful is, and I mentioned this a little bit later is, getting too salesy too fast because i think if you if you start as a community you know 
if somebody were to start as just a community and then build products, they have the benefit of that kind of space of trust and authenticity versus when you're a product oriented company and you then build a community. I think you should do it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it, but I'm saying that you want to be mindful of what the message is that you're sending out to your members about why they're joining this community. Are they joining this community because you know, those who are members are going to get special deals and benefits and, you know, perks along the way, because that's more of like a deals focused community. Are you starting a community because you realize, you know, you sell yoga mats and you realize that people need to better exercise their mindfulness. And so this is a mindfulness and awareness group. And by the way, you're going to have, you know, a pitch from time to time about the yoga mats that you sell. Like, what is the intention of the group? Does that exist elsewhere? And if it doesn't, is there enough value for the users to continue to be part of it without also feeling like they're being sold to often? Um, so that's the first thing that you want to think about. The next thing you want to think about is how does this affect your existing relationships? So any current customers that you have, any current partners that you have, any current competitors that you have, and possibly most importantly, if you shift into a community model, are there people who used to be partners that now become competitors, right? Like maybe you were, um, like think about this. Okay, so mate, so let's go back to the yoga mat thing. So maybe you have a yoga mat company and then you decide I'm going to start a mindfulness group and what you forgot was that 50% of your revenue came from this other mindfulness group that was an affiliate that now you're competing with. And so they feel less incentivized to promote you. You have to make up that revenue on your own with your own community. So thinking about the different stakeholders in your network and how they might uh, react to something that you've built or how they might be partners with something that you've built, I think is going to be really important for you as you, if you shift into that model. Do I have capacity for this? You know, and I think communities are easy. I think there's so much dialogue on, you know, oh, just start this. We have so many great tools that you can use. You can start a Slack channel. You can start a Facebook group. You can, you know, it's so easy. They're so easy to start, right? All you need is a graphic and a description and a couple of rules and you're good to go. But sustaining them is a lot of time, right? You're not only starting conversations, you're facilitating them, you're moderating daily conversations. You are setting rules. You are the one who has to decide when somebody's getting a little bit out of line in a comment and you have to decide what happens if that person says something that maybe isn't aligned with your brand at all. How is your brand now represented based on the people in the group? When do you actually kick somebody out of a group versus you know, when do you kind of let it slide? You wanna keep communication extremely high and you wanna be asking questions regularly and making sure that people feel empowered to ask their own questions as well. You want to use that as a customer service vehicle to address bugs. You want to be adding new members and recruiting people all the time because if your community, they'll all see how many people are in your group. And if they see that it's been the same number of people for the last six months, they're going to wonder why your community isn't growing. And maybe in that way, you actually don't want to be managing this community at all. Maybe you need a team member or an intern or you know somebody who can help you with that. And if you bring on an intern, I'll also tell you that they might know, not know how to do it either. So then you have to train them you know, and really make sure that they're representing you the way you wanna be represented. Laura asked, how did you grow your chapters? Do you have a chapter leader? Are they paid or volunteer? Um, and this is, this is a great point um, based on this topic. So for our chapters, they are all commission-based. Our chapter directors make commission in two ways. The first is through ticket sales and sponsorships at our events. The second is through member referrals. So every time we bring in a new member, if they came from one of our chapter leaders, they get a uh, commission for that. Um, we have always grown our chapters organically. I've seen a lot of companies that will start chapters based on um, markets where they have a lot of customers or you know strategic focuses. And I think that is their decision. Um, we have taken a little bit more of a passive approach because I also understand how important it is to have a really good on the ground leader who is not only um, excited to be there, but extremely entrepreneurial, um, extremely self-motivated and can kind of run with something. 
And because of that, we only start new chapters when somebody applies and passes the interview process of being a chapter director, because we know that they have basically what it takes to start something completely new. And even though we have um, tools for all of our chapter directors to connect with each other. We have uh, like a whole chapter director guide. It's like 30 pages long with like the whole history of Wonderful and how to do different things, how to run an event, you know, the steps to running something, templates. We have a whole spreadsheet where they can, you know, organize all the contacts they've built along the way. We have everything we can to help support them. But at the end of the day, they're an island. And if you have anyone that is building a community on your behalf, I think the very first thing it comes down to is incredible trust that they understand your brand, that they can represent it well, and that they can grow it independently without needing you because they are, uh, they're the ones who are going to do it. Um, okay, other things before you dive in. Do I have time? So we talked about do I have capacity? Do I have time is not necessarily do I have time day to day, but also if you're looking for community to either generate revenue through membership fees or generate revenue through, you know, eventually purchasing something, um, the turnaround time is pretty slow at the beginning. You know, you have to build a critical mass of members of your community first before you, just checking the time, oh my God, 3.45, almost done, um, before you start seeing the, the benefit of that, right? Before it starts getting lucrative. So you need to give yourself enough time to make sure you can just focus on building. And then of course, if you are doing something like, well, I think in any revenue generating thing in membership, you are, you're playing a different game than something where, you know, the average sale is uh, in our case, like a sponsorship of an event, in this case, an average sale is $69. You need a lot of sales in order for it to make any sort of meaningful revenue. And those of you who are in products probably understand that even better than me. And so each win is a small win. You need a lot of them. And so for your community to succeed, you have to make sure that you've got a really nice funnel starting at the top of people on your email list, people who are you know, in uh, partner organizations, if you're having a, a paid membership, then people in your Facebook group, if it's not a paid membership, even thinking about, okay, I'm trying to build my WhatsApp group. Well, where are these people coming from? Is there a referral system? Am I reaching out to organizations that whose employees will become members of this group? How am I making sure that I'm constantly having fresh new members who are bringing new value? So this is my little mini recipe for you on a great community. I don't know about you, but I've been cooking a lot lately. And so I've been thinking about this in the sense of recipe. The first thing you need is a primary channel or medium. It is really hard to grow a community with multiple channels as your primary channel. So pick a place. Maybe you're using a membership platform like Mighty Networks. Maybe you're using Facebook. Maybe you're using Slack. Maybe you're using WhatsApp, whatever it is. Choose your channel. And based on what I said before, choose it, have, have the place that people are already in heavily weigh on the channel that you choose. Number two, strong value proposition. Is this a deals community? Is this a community for tips? Are we offering emotional support? Are we doing daily affirmations, check-ins? What are we doing? The third thing is an authentic voice. I think communities know very quickly if you're just trying to sell them something. And so you wanna make sure that you are asking questions, that you're honest, that you are real with them in maybe a way that you're not real with people. Not that you're not real with people, but maybe a different way than your brand has a voice to the outside world, to your community. It's you talking to your community and they will sense that. So then you combine those ingredients and then you add a couple of other things. One, a strong group of early users. In communities, network effect is absolutely essential. Before we even started monetizing our community, we had this free and open call for anyone to be a member. And we said, come and be a member. We had literally just started. We had almost no content to offer people. We said, if you sign up now, you get a lifetime membership. We had a thousand people join on the spot because they knew that they were getting something for free. And those thousand people were an essential part of our success because without that initial dialogue, without people using each other, talking with each other, we wouldn't have had value for that first paying customer. So you wanna make sure you've got a group of people that are already ready to start, who are talking to each other, who are creating value for each other before you start monetizing. And then make sure you've built a strong referral system. And then finally, we talked about having a good funnel. The second thing is super high engagement. And um, somebody asked in one of the early questions about how to create that sense of engagement. Um, there are, so if you, so actually, 
pretty much every place where you have communities nowadays, you do have analytics. So first of all, I would track those regularly and make sure that you have a good sense of what the engagement rate is, what the new member rate is, you know, how many people are, uh, are participating, how many people are coming back, what's your return rate. Um, but the other thing I would say is uh, you may, you can only ask so many questions and you can only say so many things before it's like the Beth show in my case. So you have to have other people who are, even if it's kind of like secret and you're just sort of, you know, like sometimes I'll kind of, if I notice that it's a lot of me talking right now, I'll tap somebody I know in the group and say like, hey, can you ask this question? So it looks like not just me is the only person participating here because sometimes it's just a matter of helping people understand and see that there's real conversation, that people are really asking questions, that this isn't just Beth sharing stuff, Beth sharing stuff, Beth sharing stuff. So, um, so I think engagement is more than just a one-way street. You cannot create your own engagement. You have to get other people to do it for you. And that's why having a strong group of early users can be helpful as well. Um, and oftentimes moderators, we actually, we have a Facebook group with about 11,000 people in it. And we have a team of moderators that help manage. And those moderators have their own Facebook group with 10 people in it. And in that Facebook group, we talk about posts that have come up that we're not sure about or new policies we wanna institute or new rules. And that helps everyone stay on the same page in representing your brand and in representing the community that you wanna build. Mistakes that we see along the way, trying to sell too soon. I've mentioned that uh, a few times. Not asking enough questions. So making sure that you're asking questions of your community as much as you are incorporating their feedback. If you ask them a question, you do a poll, you do a survey, people love filling that stuff out. If you can do a little giveaway prize at the end of your survey or for people who fill it out even better, but then go back to them once you've made a decision or you've done something or you've launched something and say, don't just say, hey, I'm launching this thing. Say, hey, I listened to you. Thank you so much for providing feedback about your favorite color of yoga mat. I've now launched rainbow yoga mats because you all really wanted rainbow. Congratulations. Thank you so much. You know, and by the way, they're on sale. They're 25% off for only members in this group because you guys are amazing. I mean, really um, make sure that people know that you're listening to them. Um, oh, oh, this is a good one. So for those of you who are building Facebook groups, um, my main problem with Facebook is that you do not own the people in your Facebook group. You never own people, of course, but you do not own the contact information of the people who join your Facebook group. And that is a huge problem if you're trying to do anything with your business, because if Facebook were to do anything or change an algorithm, your whole business suffers. So ask for an email address when people join. You can actually ask questions or ask for people to opt in to um, your newsletter, ask them to do something so that even though they're coming into your Facebook group, they're not just in your Facebook group. Make sure that you're adding them to an email list or you're capturing their information somehow because that's going to be the best way that you can talk to them later. Um, not having clear rules and expectations for members to follow. So to the point of like the public versus private group, make sure that people know what to expect. Like we were saying, you know, when you walk into a room in one of these webinars, in a real room, you know how people are dressed, you know how the room is set up, you know if there's mingling beforehand. When people join your group, they don't necessarily know how they're supposed to be, if conversation is encouraged, if they should be. There's a lot of things about like self-promotion nowadays, but what about, um, what about the types of things that we want you to be posting about? What about um, uh, uh, things that are not tolerated and that will get you kicked out of the group. And so having really clear expectations that people know, a lot of times you can pin things to the top or you can have a whole, there's, um, you can do like whole learning session now in Facebook group as well, Facebook groups as well. So you can have like, this is what our organization is all about. This is what you get as a member. Here are some of the rules. Comment here if you've read the rules. Really make sure that you have uh, very clear expectations. And, and, to all of that, I will also say in, in my years of, you know, marketing by fire, I've also learned what much of probably what you all have learned, which is people only digest one thing at once. So if it's a learning module, you can only have one ask and make sure that that ask is give me your email because <laughs> you're going to need it. Um, and then the last thing is not having enough umph at the start. So the, to the point of having a group of people that join right away, 
um, or you know, a group of people that maybe get free membership in the beginning so that you have enough of that network effect to benefit people who are paying. Um, you wanna make sure that you start off with a bang, have a wait list rather than you know, just opening up your membership. Make sure that people are lined up to join so that when you do join, you can make a big announcement so a whole bunch of join, people join at the same time. And the last thing, I promised you some of my favorite tools. Um, so here they are. Our community is powered on Mighty Networks. Mighty Networks is good. They do a good job. Um, the downside is it's another app. So remember the whole thing about meet your customer where they are. Most people are not on Mighty Networks. So for us, it has been a really, the, the biggest uphill battle has getting people to learn how to use this platform, learn how to be comfortable with it, et cetera, learn how to use it, learn how to set their notifications correctly, et cetera. But the benefits for us have really outweighed you know, the, the downside. We haven't had to code our own membership community. We haven't had to use a kind of clunky WordPress app and we've done all of that before, um, or WordPress pl plugin, I should say. Um, so that's what we use for our membership community. Zoom, which we're on right now, is a just getting better and better um, in terms of having virtual events. Um, I mentioned, I didn't really talk much about what we do in our member community in the wonderful network, but um, now that everybody's staying at home and we have so many people who are hungering to travel, we have all sorts of virtual things. On Monday, we're doing a crepe making class by one of our members who's from France. We have um, language circles that people can practice their Spanish and their Dutch and their French and their Portuguese with. We have, um, we have like a salsa dancing class where you can just learn salsa in your living room. And so, and we use Zoom for all of it. So all of the signups are done in the member app and then all of the experiences are done on Zoom. Um, one really important thing too, if you do have more of a formal, actually really for any membership community, um, video is becoming more and more important. It is because people are tired of reading stuff and sometimes they just want you to tell them the thing. So even if it's, you know, you're welcome to my Facebook group post, consider doing a video and also having the text below, having it, remember how I said multiple versions of the same thing, that's going to be really helpful for you. And I will also say that, sorry, people are shallow, putting on a good face, you know, having a ring light, if you haven't seen, that's actually what this picture is. It's a ring light. If you haven't seen this before, you can get them on Amazon for like a hundred bucks. And it's um, like beauty bloggers started it actually. It, you kind of put it on your face and it makes like your eyes so shimmery and it makes your face really bright. If you get a nice ring light, uh, a high def computer camera and put yourself, don't use your sunroom in your living room as your background. Give yourself a nice background. Go in front of some wallpaper. Have like the, the logo of, you know, we have like a poster of Wonderful that I go in front of. Something that really shows off your brand better. And then a nice quality video. It doesn't have to be fancy beyond that. Um, people will see your face. They'll see how you talk. They'll understand. Um, and then, sorry, I know, gosh, I can't. I told them I wouldn't be able to stop talking once I did. This is the last slide. Um, Be Live and StreamYard, those are both my great places for live streaming. So on the point of video, um, Be Live will actually live stream to, and StreamYard too, they'll live stream to a Facebook group or a Facebook page. Um, so this is really helpful if you're doing like a webinar that doesn't need to be a closed webinar that you wanna kind of get more people into. Um, if you do a BeLive, then you can set it up. The thing that I like about it is that there's a behind the scenes space. So if you have a special guest, you can talk with them, get things set up before you start broadcasting, and then it'll automatically broadcast to your group or to your page. It also works on YouTube and it works on uh, LinkedIn, I think. Um, and you have a link in advance that you can share. So you'll know, you know, even if you set it up a week in advance, you'll have the exact link that the video is going to go to so you can share it out and schedule it and get everybody excited about it. And then they can just visit that link versus usually on Facebook, you have to just start live streaming and then people have to find you. So um, that's good. If you're not on Canva yet for all of your designs, Unsplash and Pexels are great for, uh, for royalty free um, Creative Commons uh, stuff. Um, a good email client, we use MailChimp, um, but I've heard really good things about ConvertKit as well. And then of course Slack, whether it's for your community or whether it's for the people who run your community, 
um, to have conversations with each other. And then the last thing I'm going to say to you, and then I'll try to get through some of these questions as well. And if you have other questions, go ahead and put them in there. I'll answer as many as I can in the like four minutes that we have. Um, the other thing I will say is that I have an ask for all of you. I can't end this without having an ask of my own. So we have, um, we're of course building our membership community. We have open enrollment until May 1st. If you wanna learn more, go to she'swonderful.com slash join. If you know any women who love to travel, I would love for you to share this with one person. Do that for me as the gift, the gift for me in exchange for giving you this presentation. Share wonderful with one person, shoot an email with one person who you know is always traveling and say, hey, saw the founder of this really cool organization, do this thing, check out membership. Do that thing for me. I would love it and appreciate you. Um, and if there's anything that I can do in the future, so that was, I'll tell you again, she'swonderful.com slash join. And then if you need anything from me in the future, you can go directly to me. That's my personal email, beth at bethsantos.com. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter, Maximum Beth and She's Wonderful. Um, I'm always happy to help you build those communities. And I think it's a, a better time than ever to do that. So I hope this has been helpful for you. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you. You're so welcome. I'm clapping for Woo. everyone. <laughs> while you, Beth, while you're looking through the questions that came through the chat, we want to open yeah. up the phone lines really quickly and we can kind oh, of go great. back and forth during this time. So um, for those that have a question that would like to ask Beth directly, we're going to open up the line so you can ask that question. So do they have to raise their hand, Christina, to do so? So we will, while Christine is doing that, if, if, if you have a yeah. question in the chat, we can address one of the questions and we'll get to someone that's live. Yeah, totally. So I see a question about for your Facebook group, did you only rely on organic growth or did you run Facebook ads to increase membership? What are your thoughts on running Facebook ads? Um, we have only done it organically. The one thing I would say to you is, so let's go back to the yoga mat example, um, say I have a company for yoga mats and it's called Yoga Moga. And what I wouldn't do is have a Facebook group called Yoga Moga because Facebook has an algorithm and it will share groups that are similar. So if somebody's part of another yoga group, then they will see your yoga group promoted, but you have to make sure you're telling Facebook what it is. So you'll see we have what's called a long tail Facebook group title. It's called, uh, it's like, wonderful women who travel hyphen for women who love to travel or something like that and for you it should be it should be called yoga lovers international or we love yoga or yoga is for you know whatever it is because then that signals to facebook to share your group with other similar people who are in similar groups to yours so i would actually encourage you to not have it just be named after your business unless you want like a kind of secret exclusive group for your business. In terms of ads, we have never run ads um, for the group. We have thought about it. I think um, we focused on ads for other things. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to do ads. It's just a matter of how much budget you want to align to it. I think we've kind of found that if we're spending, you know, less than a few hundred dollars, it's really not worth it for us to create an ad. And, and in our case, um, the, it, it, it would just be much more economical for us to actually spend money on an ad that then is directly tied to a conversion versus a Facebook group membership that then translates to a regular membership is a little bit too long of a customer journey for us. Um, but not, not impossible to do. I haven't seen a lot of them. Um, but you definitely could. And, you know, the other side of the argument is Facebook sometimes is now really prioritizing the paid stuff. So, right. All right. Christina, was there any people that had their hand raised during any of the attendees? We can't hear you, Christina. Oh, sorry. No, I want to encourage anyone to raise their hand. We can see it here. No one has a raise at the moment. Uh, so either, oh, I have Jessica Primavera. Let me unmute you. Really so quick. we'll take these two, one or two. Um, welcome, Jessica. Questions. Hey, Christina. Hi, so welcome. Good to see your face. <laughs> 
Hi, Beth. I was part of the um, the WinLab uh, Babson group that just uh, graduated this past February down in Miami. So, oh, nice. Congrats. Yeah, thanks. Um, so right now I run um, Unbound, and it's a marketplace that connects travelers with hosts who run bespoke types of trips. And we started a community of hosts where they're supporting each other and trying to think about how can they bridge the gap financially between now and when people start traveling mm -hmm. again. Yeah. But there's also just, you know, a lot of worry because there's so much uncertainty. People are having to shift and pick up other jobs. Um, they're also trying to focus on their own communities and engage them. And I was just wondering if you had any advice, like specifically in that area, because I know you also are wonderful, also runs trips. What are you guys doing while like everything related to travel right now is essentially on pause? I think in our case, travel is something that, that and, and for you actually, I love that you have a community of your hosts because I think they're gonna identify in the same way as what I'm about to say, which is for us, the members of the wonderful community, travel runs through their veins. They're not just going on a trip one couple times a year, or maybe they are, but they're thinking about it all the time. And so even though we're not traveling right now, we are regularly thinking about it. And we're also thinking about it in the context of building our global mindedness. And, and that you can do even from your screen. In fact, we talk about that all the time, how travel really only consists of challenging your expectations and trying something new. And so I think um, for your hosts, I would say, you know, encourage them to, to share their feelings, um, encourage them to share what they're doing with one another so that they can all share ideas. I think if you can be a space of, support and advocacy and you know helping them find solutions to get them to that next place then mm -hmm. they're going to come back to you when travel does start happening and say wow this group really helped me out in ways that i couldn't have even imagined so now i'm going to be even more invested in it again um so yeah i would definitely start there like really understand their real needs i wouldn't even try to push travel but at the same time sometimes mm -hmm. people just want to talk about travel because they miss it a lot and mm -hmm. that's okay too yeah yeah Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So thank I don't you. see any other hands. We, I just want to say thank you again, Beth, for your time and giving us these valuable tips and best practices to apply to our businesses, especially during these times. Again, the recording will be sent out to all the attendees um, soon. So we want to thank you again for attending this webinar and also register for any upcoming webinars that we have um, coming up through WinLab and Sewell. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to write, well, I'm just going to write on the chat real quick for any questions that weren't answered just to reach out to you directly. Yep. And then we're going to stop the recording as well. Yep. Okay. Thank and you. then, right. and then we will note that in the um, follow up email. Is that good? Great. Right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank you. Stay safe Bye -bye. out there. All right. Bye-bye.